In today's video, we'll be looking at web applications and the HTTP protocol. Let's get started. Now let's look at web and HTTP. First, let's review how the web applications work. The basic activity in question is viewing web pages. An individual web page consists of multiple objects. It starts with a base page written in HTML, and these pages are stored on web servers. While an entire web page may be contained in a base HTML file, that is very uncommon on modern websites. Typically, once the client retrieves the base HTML file, it will parse that file and find that many other objects are referenced. And in turn, it will connect either back to the same web server or other web servers to retrieve those other objects. These objects can be more HTML pages, code such as JavaScript, images such as JPEGs. Each of these referenced objects has its own unique URL and need not be hosted on the same server as the base web page. I've been using the terms client and server heavily, so let's look at those. The client is the browser application that requests the web page. This is the interface that you're used to dealing with, such as Chrome or Firefox, Internet Explorer, Edge, and so on. The server is the application running on the other end of the connection and delivering the web pages. Some examples of servers are Apache, Nginx, or IIS. Both the client and the server must speak HTTP in order to understand each other. The basic HTTP interaction is quite simple, consisting of a request and a response. These HTTP messages are sent over TCP. The server is running on port 80, listening for incoming connections, and when the client is ready to request a page, it initiates a TCP connection to the server on port 80. When the message exchange is complete, then the TCP connection is closed. HTTP is an example of a stateless protocol, meaning that the HTTP protocol does not remember information about past connections when establishing a new connection. Now it turns out that many web applications want to behave in a stateful manner, and so other mechanisms have been built that allow the web applications to maintain state, but it is not part of the HTTP protocol itself. Maintaining consistent state is a complicated problem, and so separating it from the HTTP protocol allows for that protocol to be much more simple and therefore much more robust. The earliest HTTP connections used a non-persistent HTTP, meaning that a new connection was opened for every single object and then closed as soon as that object was delivered. A relatively early optimization was to keep the TCP connection open for delivering subsequent objects. This reduced the overhead of opening and closing new TCP connections. Let's see how that worked. With non-persistent HTTP, we're loading a web page which references 10 JPEG images, so a total of 11 objects need to be transferred. We're showing this on a time sequence diagram, which will be a common way of representing protocols as we move through the course. The interaction begins with establishing the TCP connection by the client and the server accepting the connection. This takes one round trip time. Once the connection is established, the HTTP client may send a request for the base web page, and the HTTP server will respond by sending back that page in a message. Once that message is received, then the server closes the TCP connection. However, at that point, the client receives the base HTML file, parses it, and finds that it needs 10 more objects. The client and server must then repeat this whole process for each of the 10 objects. So let's see how that's different when we have persistent HTTP. The client must still initiate the TCP connection and wait for an acknowledgement from the server before it is able to request the file. It then requests the base file and gets that message back from the server. At this point, it's taken two round trip times to retrieve the base HTTP file. So let's see how persistent HTTP can improve on that. With persistent HTTP, which was specified in the 1.1 version of the standard, the server leaves the connection open even after it sends the message back to the client. This means that the client can make a subsequent request over that same connection without having to wait the round trip time to open a new HTTP connection. As the client is parsing the base HTML file, it sends requests for additional objects one after another. This means that only half the total number of round trip times required for subsequent objects, assuming these objects are fairly small. So let's see what's contained in an HTTP message. First of all, HTTP messages are written in ASCII text. That means we can read them directly. Certain formatting is used to help the message recipient parse the message. The HTTP request messages consist of the request line itself with a number of additional headers. In this example, we can see where the client is asking to get index.html. It's specifying that it wants to use the 1.1 version of the HTTP protocol, i.e. asking the server to leave the connection open after each object. And it uses both a carriage return and a new line character to delimit each line of the request message. The header lines tell the server a number of other things about the connection. 
including the name of the host that the client is trying to contact, what browser the user is using, and information about the encodings that that browser is willing to accept. At the end of the header lines, an additional blank line with another character turn and new line is used to indicate the end of the message. Here's another view of a message with the message fields labeled. Another type of request message that a client may send is the post method. This is typically used when web pages have a form into which the user has entered information. This user input would then appear in the body of the message after the header lines. Another commonly seen message of sending information to the server by the client is encoding it into the URL string of the GET request. In that case, the name of the resource being requested is followed by a question mark, which is in turn followed by the fields being transferred from the client to the server. The head method allows the client to request just header info about a particular object without the object itself being transferred to the client. Lastly, the put method is designed for allowing the client to upload a file to the server. Now let's look at the response that the server might send back after receiving one of these requests. In the first line, we see the status, confirming the HTTP protocol version, but also whether or not it's able to service the request. In this case, the 200 indicates a successful response. We see that the server is providing the system time, as well as the application and version of the server software that's running, and then information about the particular object requested, such as when it was modified last, and its size and bytes. The header again ends with a duplicate carriage return new line, and then the body follows containing the object requested. The HTTP protocol defines many status codes, but examples of common codes include 200 OK, the successful response, 300 series status codes, which indicate that the object was moved and will specify the new location, 400 series errors, such as bad request or 404 not found, and 500 series errors, which usually indicate a problem on the server side. Because the HTTP protocol uses ASCII text, you can interact with one over a telnet session. In this example, you would telnet to the website of choice, but then add the port number 80 at the end. Otherwise, telnet's going to default to a different port and you won't end up communicating with the web server process. Anything typed in after the connection opens will be sent over to the web server. So you could type by hand or copy and paste a simple web request, finishing it by hitting carriage return twice, and then view the text of the response sent by the server, which should include the status, headers, and body of the web page, just as we saw in the previous example. So if you recall a few slides back, I said that in practice, many web applications want to maintain some state. So let's see how that functionality has been added on top of the stateless HTTP web protocol. So in this example, the server side is maintaining some information about the user that's connecting to it in the server's database. So first we see the client telling the server to lock record X and the server acknowledges this request. We see that a lock has been placed on the database. So that's a change of state, but that is outside the HTTP protocol. The client follows up by updating X to X prime, which is acknowledged. So again, state has been changed in the database, but the database is not part of the HTTP protocol. And then the client performs another update, updating X prime to X double prime. And to finish it off, the client unlocks the record. So all of these requests are independent of each other, i.e. stateless, but it resulted in changing state on the server side by higher level application behaviors. So if there were some disruption along the way, the client would be able to recover by reading the database state and just sending the next message in the sequence. It wouldn't have to worry about resynchronizing with some protocol level state because none is maintained. This is effectively the process that is used to handle cookies. Cookies are small pieces of information sent by web servers to clients via the headers of response messages. The client then stores these pieces of information and includes them on future request messages. This allows the server to associate requests with a particular user that maps to some entry in its database. So for example, if a user is browsing an e-commerce website for the first time, they will not have an existing cookie for that site. So the site will create a new cookie ID that it hasn't used for any other database entries, and it will create a corresponding new database entry that matches the cookie. Subsequently, when that same browser, presumably from the same user, connects to the website, it will send this cookie ID with it. This may be used for all sorts of things, some desirable and some not. For example, it allows an e-commerce website to maintain the contents of a user's shopping cart. So let's look at an example. This client has previously been to eBay and has a cookie with an ID number specific to the eBay website. When it connects to a new server, let's say Amazon, it won't send its eBay cookie. It will send an HTTP request message with no cookie associated with it, and the Amazon server will create a new ID and a new entry in its backend database. Then the response message comes back, and in the header is the directive for the client to set the cookie with this new ID. 
Now the client has two cookies stored. But now whenever the client requests resources from the same server, it will include the cookie ID with it, and this will allow the server to associate those requests with the same users in its backend database. A week later, we still have these cookies set, and the servers can still associate that user with those database entries. So some examples of what the cookies are used for might be authorization, meaning tracking whether a user has signed in or not on the website, keeping track of the shopping cart, showing the user recommendations based on what they've viewed in the past, or some sort of stateful web interface such as email. We typically hear about cookies and their negative relationship with privacy. In particular, third-party cookies allow a user to be tracked across multiple websites meaning each of those websites includes objects from the third party that let this third party know about the various URLs the user is visiting. Okay, let's look at how web caches interact with the HTTP protocol. Web caches, also known as proxy servers, serve multiple functions, but the basic goal is to return the object the client is requesting without having to contact the original web server, also known as the origin server. Most web caches today are what are called transparent caches, so no user configuration is required their operation is transparent to the end user. Whenever the cache receives a request for a particular object, it will execute a conditional behavior and return a local copy of the cached object if it exists and is not expired. Otherwise, the cache will send the request to the origin server for that object and both return it to the user and store a copy of it in case future requests come in for the same object. Let's see what that looks like. So in this first example, the HTTP request went to the proxy server, which did not have a copy of the object being requested so it forwarded the request onto the origin server, which returned the object, which is now stored both on the proxy server and in the browser on the client. A short time later, a second client requests the same object. And this time the proxy server sends back its copy and the origin server does not receive a second request for that object. This both reduces traffic between the proxy server and the origin server and reduces load on the origin server. Web caching is extremely prevalent in the internet today. It is done at multiple stages of the network, including within the browser itself, in enterprise and campus networks, in residential ISPs, by content providers connected throughout the internet, and so on. As far as the details of the web cache operation, the web cache is acting both as a client and a server. It acts as a server for the requests that come in from the end user and as a client to retrieve objects from the origin server. Another benefit to web caching is that the response time for the second client in the example we just saw is extremely fast because it is relatively close to the proxy server. Let's see if we can quantify the benefit of a web cache. This institution has a relatively slow internet access link and some very high network delays. We'll consider a typical web object size of 100,000 bits and say that on average, browsers are requesting 15 objects per second from the origin servers. This yields an average downstream data rate from origin servers to browsers of one and a half megabits per second or very close to the capacity of the link. The LAN itself, on the other hand, is well provisioned at one gigabit per second, and so is very lightly utilized. Because the access link utilization is so high, average delays can increase dramatically. One solution to this is just to upgrade the access link. So now we'll redo the numbers with the access link bandwidth increased by two orders of magnitude to 154 megabits per second. Now the access link utilization has dropped dramatically, and it is no longer in a state where high queuing delays would be expected. The drawback to this approach is that access links are expensive, and now the institution must pay a significantly higher amount to its internet service provider. Let's instead go back to our original access link and try installing a web cache instead and see how that affects the numbers. This involves an upfront cost of purchasing the hardware and an ongoing cost of supplying power and cooling to the server. However, these two things are relatively inexpensive compared to the cost of bandwidth on access links. So now let's compute our new utilization numbers. First, we must recognize that not every request will be able to be served by the cache. So for this example, we'll assume that 40% of the requests arrive at the cache and are able to be handled, but that 60% must be forwarded on to the origin servers. So now our access link utilization will be 60% of what it was before. We've also reduced our average end-to-end -end delay by satisfying 40% of the requests at the cache. Note that this means that our average time to satisfy web requests is lower than even with the much higher bandwidth link because of the lower latencies involved. Let's look at one more feature of the protocol that helps these caches function. This is the conditional get. When the cache receives a request for a new object, it may want to check and see if there's a newer version on the origin server. One way for it to do this would be to make a head request and see if the last modified date has changed. However, 
If it has changed, then the proxy server would need to send an additional GET request. The conditional GET allows it to perform these two functions in one request. In the conditional GET request, the cache specifies the last known date when the object was updated and tells the server to only send the object if a newer version is available. If there's no newer version, it will send back a status code indicating that the object has not been modified since the date specified by the cache. So as an example, the client sends a conditional get with an if modify since date, and the state on the server is that the object has not been modified, so it sends back the response and header, but no object body. However, if the object is subsequently modified and the client again sends a conditional get request, the response will include both the 200 OK and the object requested. So far, we've discussed HTTP 1.0 and 1.1. The goal of HTTP 2 is to further decrease delays in serving web requests. First, let's look at a little more detail on HTTP 1.1. When a client submits multiple GET requests to the server, the server replies to each of those in order with the status code, headers, message body, etc. However, there are some scenarios where a small object may get stuck behind a larger object and thus be delayed. It could also be the case that a packet was lost and all the objects are delayed waiting for TCP to retransmit the lost pieces of data. HTTP2 allows a couple of important modifications to this. It allows the browser to specify the priority of its objects, and so the server may not respond in the same order that the requests are received, but instead respond in priority order. The server may also know that certain referenced objects will be needed later on and proactively push those to the client even before the client knows and needs to request them. HTTP2 also allows for frame scheduling to avoid the head of line blocking problem. Let's see an example of HTTP2. We see that the client is requesting a sequence of objects, object 1, object 2, object 3, object 4. And it happens that object 1 is much larger than the other three. With first come first serve, the three small objects will have to wait until the one large object is delivered before they can be sent. And this is what we call the head of line blocking problem. With interleaved frame transmission and scheduling, the server is sending back pieces of the large object, but also sending back the small objects. So in this case, the small objects get delivered much sooner and the client is able to work with those and start displaying them or whatever it needs to do while the large object continues to be delivered in the background. This causes a slight delay to the completion of delivering object one, but significantly reduces the time to deliver objects two, three, and four. The HTTP3 protocol aims to push this even further. We'll talk about this in more detail later on, but the main contributions of HTTP3 are security and moving error recovery and congestion control into the application protocol and performing all of this over UDP. Keep in mind that the HTTP versions we looked at prior to version 3 all operated over TCP and relied on TCP for error recovery, congestion control, and flow control. That completes our look at web and HTTP. In the next video, we'll be looking at the email application along with two different email protocols. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.